Good morning. Thank you for joining us for Church at Church on the Rock Online. We're grateful that you've joined us, and we pray that our service will be inspirational and uplifting to you. Uh, as we get started, as we have in the past, please do us a favor, click in the comment section below and just say good morning, uh, say hello, uh, greet each other as we would in our normal worship services. And if you, rec if you see a name down there that you don't recognize, please introduce yourself and make those people feel welcome as well. We're grateful that you've joined us for worship. We do have an announcement to make. We have been announcing our plan to open our worship center to in-place worship services again in our church beginning next Sunday. Our ministry board has met. We still are not comfortable that it is safe. And so that date is going to slip. We uh, don't have a date yet. We are still trying to get everything ready and everything in place. And when we deem it is safe to do so, we will reopen our worship center for worship services in place. Please be watching your email. We are going to be sending out some information this week to inform you what it will look like under phase three for us to open our worship services. And just to give you an idea of what to expect. But our hope is that we will be able to open very shortly when we get all of the supplies necessary to do that. Uh, we are just having a difficult time with supplies. The supply chain is uh, very limited on some of the things we need. And so we have to delay just a little bit longer. But be with us. Be patient. We will reopen uh, sooner rather than later is our hope. So we will keep you informed of that. Now, as we begin our worship service, I pray that you will uh, prepare your hearts as we enter into worship through song. Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me Every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes.
beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me
Good morning, Church on the Rock. And again, welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. And this morning, I just want to take this uh, opportunity to thank God for a new day. A day of his making, and, and thank you, Lord, for just allowing us to be a part of it. Oh, what a wonderful day it is to be in the Lord. So this morning, if you would come with me, please, to the book of Psalms. This morning, I will be reading Psalms 12. And my Bible has the title, Man's Treachery and God's Constancy. Help, O Lord, for the godly man ceases. For the faithful disappears from among the sons of men. They speak idly, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. Who have said, with our tongues we will prevail? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth. Purified seven times, you shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked prowl on every side, when the vileness is exalting among the sons of men. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just come right now this morning. We come, Lord God, and as always, we come with that one desire, and that is to know all that we need and to understand the Word of God in our lives as we go forth. This morning, Father, we're just so thankful and grateful that we have this opportunity to come together, even if it's by video, Lord God, but to share in your Word amongst each other. We thank you, Lord God, first of all, for all that you've done in our lives and all that you're still doing. But most of all, we love you, Lord, and we seek your forgiveness. We seek your guidance, and we seek, oh, Lord God, just to be near to you. This morning, Father God, we come before you to lift up those who are part of our congregation and those who are part of this community who are sick and shut in. We ask, O oh, Heavenly Father, that you would just bless them this morning, that you would touch them with your hands of mercy, and that you will assure them that all is well. O oh, Father God, we have seen many things come in our lives and go, but we know this for sure, that your word lasts forever. It is living. Oh, and it is the direction that we need for our lives. Father God, we just want to thank you for your triumphal entry into our world each and every day. Your word is our compass, and it helps us to see our lives as complete in Christ. Thank you for sending Jesus. He opened our eyes to see your kingdom come here on earth. Father, you sent Jesus that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Forgive us for the times where we have gone about our own business, oblivious to the needs of those around us, oblivious to the call of your love in our hearts. So Father, today help us to remember that our relationship with you and with others is more important than anything else. Your word says to trust in you with all my heart without leaning on my own understanding and to acknowledge you in all my ways that you may direct my path. Lord, we, hope, we lay hold of your guidance today and always. Take away our fears of tomorrow and give us confidence for today. Grant us wisdom to make decisions that reflect your plans for us. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my race, but yours be won. So today, dear God, 
We praise your endless power, your creative genius, your infinite wisdom, and your external existence. Oh, and we thank you for your boundless care, your unerring guidance, and your great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Oh, Father God, we know that sometimes we just don't get it right. And we know, Father God, that as we lift up our hands and our hearts to you, Lord God, towards the heavens, we know that there is a God up there. There is a God who is able to do all that we ask. Father, we ask that this morning, as we open up our ears to receive your word, as we open up our eyes to see your creative glory, Lord God, we just ask that you increase in us even the more. Increase in us your word, Lord God, that we may take it with us as we go forth on this journey. Increase us in us even the more, Father, as we come upon situations and circumstances in lives that would hinder us or cause us to detour from what you have led us into, Lord God. I thank you this morning, Lord. I thank you for my life, my health, and my strength. I thank you this morning, Lord God, for the life of my family, their health, and their strength. And above all, Lord God, I lift up our congregation, our community, our world, and thank you for how you're moving in such a matter. Oh, this morning, Lord God, we will open up the, the fifth chapter of, of John. And we will talk about things, oh Lord God, where our, our Lord and Savior asks the question. So Father God, we come now with ears and eyes to see your magnificence, glory, and your power. We lift up our shepherd this morning and ask that you will continually bless him, Lord God, as he bring forth your word. And as we continue our study in the gospel of John, I seek your face, Lord God. We seek your face. We seek to understand. And we seek, Lord God, to be like Christ. So, Father God, again, bless him, bless his wife, and bless our congregation. And every door that opens up in the name of Jesus. We ask, Lord God, that you just keep your hands upon them. And those who are in need, those who are seeking, help us to bring a word to them. We thank you, Lord God. This we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And amen. Thank you, Sydney. I once read a story of three umpires, and they were talking about the sense of power that they had when they were calling a baseball game. And as they reflected, they talked a little bit about how they had this, uh, uh, what about the game gave, this, gave them this sense of empowerment. And the first umpire said, well, I call him like I see him. And the second uh, umpire said, well, I call him like they really are. Kind of criticizing the first man that maybe you, the way he saw it wasn't the way they really are. And then the third umpire said, kind of lifted his chin and smiled and says, Well, boys, until I call them, they ain't nothing. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a certain degree of truth to that, isn't there? We're going to see in our story from Scripture today, in our lesson from today, we're going to see that there are three main actors. The first one is Jesus. There's going to be a lame man. And then we're going to find the leaders of the Jews who are uh, probably led by the Pharisees. Now, it's good to understand that the Pharisees, like the umpires, considered themselves the umpires of the Jewish people. And they would call them like they saw them. And even if they didn't see them, they'd still call them. They tried to help God out. If there was a law in the Old Testament that was too vague they would come up with ways to clarify it so people knew exactly what it meant and what they could and could not do to keep from breaking that law. For example, the Sabbath. The Sabbath was very clearly stated that we are to keep it holy and we keep it holy by not working. But they never defined, the law didn't define what work was. Well, 
don't let that bother you. The Pharisees stepped right in to help God out. And not only did they help God out, they created 1,521 rules to define exactly what work was so that people would know exactly what they could do and not do, what constituted work and what did not constitute work, so that they would not make the mistake of violating the Sabbath. Listen to some of their silly rules. Uh, for instance, if you had a lamp and it was getting dark and your wick in the lamp burned out, it was considered work to replace the wick. So instead of replacing the wick, you had to spend the rest of the Sabbath in darkness. Another rule was that you couldn't tie a knot and you couldn't kill a flea on the Sabbath. Those were considered work. Another one, a woman was not allowed to look into the mirror. Well, that seems odd. Why not? Because she might see a gray hair and pull it out. And if she were to do that, she would be guilty of the performing the work of reaping. So they had a lot of strange laws. What we're going to see today is another one of those was that you were not allowed to heal on the Sabbath. That was considered work. So remember, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. We're going to be looking today at the third sign in the Gospel of John. John has seven signs, and these signs are designed specifically to help people see that Jesus is the Son of God and to help them come to believe that in Christ by faith. And so he's very deliberate in what he's doing. This is the third of seven. And it comes from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and I'll begin reading it verse 1, and stop at 9, and then we'll pick up the rest of it a little bit later. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up from Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And when I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up. Take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Here we see Jesus at the pool of Bethesda and coming alongside and finding this man who was an invalid and had been for 38 years. Now, for years, critics of Scripture believe that this was a made-up story, that the pool wasn't real, that John just made it up as a way to, to kind of introduce this conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. And that people held that belief until someday the pool was actually discovered. Someone actually found the pool. So in this picture, you can see that it probably took a lot of digging because for centuries, one layer of the city was built on top of another layer. And so they would, as a place would get ruined, they would level that and build on top of that. That would get ruined. They would level that and build on top of that. And so it just one layer on top of another. And you can see from this photo just how deep the pool is now. But back in the days of Jesus, it probably looked more like this picture. You can see here that the pools were near the sheep gate. And the sheep gate was where the sheep which were going to be sacrificed in the temple were brought into the city. And as you can see, the pool is not very far from the temple. Just, just a little bit away from it uh, to the north. Now, inside the Pool of Bethesda, uh, people would gather. And it may have looked like this, uh, at, taken from a movie, 
about the life of Jesus, and this picture is taken from the time he was with the man at the pool. Here it is that lame people, blind people, paralyzed people would wait in hopes that when the waters bubbled up, that they could be the first one into the water and be healed. You see, legend had it that the first person, that an angel of the Lord would come and stir the water, and the first person to get into the water after the angel stirred it would be healed. But this man didn't have anyone to get him into the pool. But if you were at the pool and the water stirred and you went to try to get to it, if you didn't get healed, it was because either you weren't the first person or you didn't have faith. One of those two reasons. Now, this man had been there for 38 years. Jesus knew that he'd been there a long time. So for 38 years, he had been waiting and hoping that he someday might actually make it into the pool first and be healed. But then Jesus saw him and Jesus healed him. And that's where this story takes a little bit of a bend. In verse 6, we see that Jesus saw him lying by the pool and he knew that he'd been there for 38 years and he asked him a question that many would consider odd. Do you want to get well? It's odd for a couple of reasons, but I want to focus on odd in the sense that at this time, during a festival season in Jerusalem, there could have been upwards as many as 200 people around the pools hoping to be able to get into the pool or more likely hoping to beg money uh, from the people who are by the pools so that they could live another day. But here we had this person, up to 200 people, and we see that this was the only man that Jesus healed that day. There were others, but Jesus only healed this one man. Now that doesn't seem fair. Why did Jesus ignore all the others and heal this man? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I have a couple ideas. Uh, first of all, this man had been there for 38 years. Everybody in town knew this man had been there for 38 years. Everyone in town knew that this man had not walked in 38 years. Everyone knew that this man was an invalid. Everyone knew he probably wasn't going to be able to get to the pool when it was stirred. So that when Jesus healed him, everyone knew that it was Jesus who healed him. Not the waters. It was Jesus who healed him. It was a legitimate miracle performed by Jesus. And that's important. The next thing it tells us is that this specific man on this specific day why did Jesus choose this man on this day? Well, my guess is that he was trying to set up a situation we could have an opportunity to talk to people. He wanted to gain the attention of people. But who? Who did he want to gain the attention of? Well, we need to ask a couple more questions then. Here's the question we need to ask. What day of the week was this? Well, we saw in verse 9, it's the Sabbath, right? Jesus knew that you couldn't heal on the Sabbath. That was considered work. He also knew that to take up your mat and walk on the Sabbath was also considered work. Now, Jesus didn't have to heal this man on this day. But he did. He could have healed him on a Monday. He could have healed him on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. He could have healed him the day before the Sabbath, the day after the Sabbath. But Jesus saw him on this day, and Jesus healed him on the Sabbath. He waited deliberately to heal him on the Sabbath. And what did the man do immediately after Jesus healed him? He picked up his mat, and he walked. 
Remember, this is the Sabbath. Walking with your mat on the Sabbath is considered work. And the Pharisees saw the man carrying his mat on the Sabbath, and he, they challenged him and said, that's a violation of the rules. You cannot carry your mat on the Sabbath. It was considered work. And so they were furious. And they cried out, who is it that did this? And the man told him that he didn't know who it was because it was crowded. But later Jesus revealed himself. We'll see that in just a little bit. And then he knew and then he told the Pharisees. So Jesus knew it was a Sabbath. He knew carrying your mat on the Sabbath was considered work. He knew that this would cause a conflict. And Jesus did that on purpose. He wanted to get the attention of the Jewish leaders so that they would hear what he had to say. And they weren't going to like what he had to say. So let's continue with verse 10 and following. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered him, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know that who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus said to them, My father is working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his Father, making himself equal with God. From this point on, I want us to stop and focus on what the Jewish leaders heard Jesus say. What did they hear Jesus say that day? Jesus knew full well that this man carrying his mat on this day was going to make the crowd angry. Because the Pharisees had already created over 1,500 ways to get angry for someone for working on the Sabbath. Sure enough, the crowd got angry. And they came looking for Jesus. And when they came looking for Jesus, they had one question on their mind. What right do you have to do this on the Sabbath? By what right do you heal this man on the Sabbath? Well, let's think about that. By what right did Jesus heal this man on the Sabbath? Well, he had the right to heal on the Sabbath because he's God. He was the Lord of the Sabbath. He was the one who created the Sabbath. He was the one who created the rule to keep holy the Sabbath and to not work on the Sabbath. He was the one who put it all in place in the first place. And now Jesus is having this confrontation with the Pharisees. And he continually has this confrontation with the Pharisees throughout his life. And usually it's because he kind of sets them up. In the book of Matthew, the Gospel according to Matthew, we read about Jesus and his disciples and how the Pharisees criticized them for taking heads of grain from the field and rubbing them between their hands so that they could get wheat to eat. And they complained to Jesus about that they were breaking the Sabbath because they were working, they were reaping. Remember pulling the little gray hair was considered reaping? Now they're really reaping. They're taking literal grains of wheat and rubbing it so that they could take the grains and eat them. And so they're complaining to Jesus that they're violating the Sabbath. So Jesus reminds them. He takes them back into the Old Testament and he reminds them of the time that 
David is running from King Saul because Saul wants to kill him. And he's running, he and his men, and they stop. They're hungry. They stop at the temple. They talk to the priest. David asks for food, and the priests give David and his men food from the temple. But that bread was bread that was set aside for only priests to eat. So they violated the purpose of the bread. They gave it to David so David could live. Then Jesus says this very important thing in that situation. He says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what it means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, Jesus is saying here, I do what I want to do on the Sabbath because I'm God. I do what I want to do on the Sabbath because I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I created it. Now, on this occasion, on the, the occasion of healing this lame man, Jesus gets a little more direct with the Pharisees. Listen to what he says. He says, My father is working until now, and I am working. That created an immediately a frenzy among the group, among the crowd. We're told this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, that was bad enough, right? You're working, you're breaking the Sabbath. But he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now I want you to note that phrase, making himself equal with God. It doesn't say that the Jewish leaders misunderstood that Jesus was saying he was equal with God. It doesn't say that Jesus didn't mean to say he wasn't equal with God. It says Jesus deliberately said what he said so that the Jewish leaders would understand exactly what they understood. That Jesus was claiming himself equal with God. This is a repeated theme through Scripture and throughout the Gospel of John that Jesus is equal with God. John's purpose, remember, is to show people that Jesus was God. And he begins with the very first verse in the Gospel of John. John 1 verse 1 and John 1 verse 14 say this. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was was God and he and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth in John chapter 14 verse 9 Jesus is speaking to Philip and he says anyone who has seen me has seen the father in John chapter 10 verse 30 Jesus says I and the Father are one. And after Jesus said that statement, the crowd tried to stone him to death for blasphemy. You see, the crowd understood exactly what Jesus was claiming. He was claiming he was God. And it would have been blasphemy if Jesus had not been God. The Jewish leaders rejected Jesus' claim because they couldn't understand it. And in their minds, if they can't understand something, then it can't be true. Now, I'm sorry, it doesn't matter to me what you believe, or what you understand, or what I understand. What really matters is, what does the scripture actually say? What does it teach? And it teaches clearly that Jesus is God. That is exactly what the Bible teaches. Now, there's a lot of stuff that I don't understand. There's a lot of stuff uh, in the world that I just don't understand. For example, when I was stationed in England, one of my friends came to me and says, Hey, I just read that the Amateur Radio Club is going to have classes for anyone who would like to become an amateur radio operator. Hey, would you like to go with me? Well, I had friends who were amateur radio operators. I had uh, friends of my parents who were amateur radio operators. Susan's grandfather was an amateur radio operator. So I was interested 
in amateur radio. I just never taken the time. So I said, yeah, let's do this. This will be fun. So I did. And I studied amateur radio. I studied radio theory. I studied electronics. And I worked all my way all the way up to extra class amateur radio license, which is the highest that you can uh, actually acquire. And so I had to study things like circuitry and all these formulas on electronics, how to calculate the right connections for making an antenna and how, what frequencies it would propagate on and, and all, you know, all the different things on how to make circuitry work. I had to be able to read electronic schematic diagrams and I learned enough that I could pass the test. But even after reaching extra class, I still have no idea how talking into a microphone changes that into an electric current that gets picked up and amplified and transmitted across uh, an antenna around the world to the other side of the world where someone else can receive that signal on his antenna and hear my voice. I don't know how that works. And I studied all of this. I still have no idea how that actually works. So there are lots of things I don't understand. But the thing is, concerning God, the Bible tells us that's always going to be true about him. We're never going to be able to understand God. Listen to what Isaiah 55 says. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God is so beyond our understanding that it is pure foolishness to reject something simply because to reject something about God, to reject something that can't be true simply because we don't understand it. But here's the big question. Why would Jesus even care if we knew he was God? And the answer is this. Jesus cared because only God could do what Jesus came to do. It mattered because only God could offer himself on the cross for our sins. No mortal human being was good enough. No mortal human being was sinless, perfect. So no normal mortal human being could take our place and pay our punishment. Again, back in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 59, this is what we read. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. Are you upset with the injustice in the world? God was upset long before we became upset. The Lord looked and he was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate, and the helmet of salvation on his head. On the, he put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. See, God looked everywhere, and he couldn't find a single person who could bring us salvation. So he did it for us himself. Salvation was something that only God could do. And that's why in Philippians chapter 2 we read this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. That literally means he emptied himself. Made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. When Jesus stepped down out of heaven, he made himself nothing. He literally emptied himself of his godness 
so that he could come and live among us and die for us. See, that's what the virgin birth is all about. There was no earthly father. His father was his heavenly father. That's why the angel said to Mary in Luke chapter 1, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. All three persons of the Trinity are mentioned in that verse. But still, why would Jesus make such a big deal about this? Why is it such a big deal? Jesus emptied himself of his godhood, and he took on the form of man. And because the perfect, righteous, sinless, holy God became mortal man, he could die. And he could then take away our sins. This is such a powerful concept that we find it woven all the way through the scriptures. All the way through. But here's the thing I want you to understand. It's so much more than just a theological truth. It's so much more. It goes to the very heart and nature of who God is. His very character. It, he wants us to understand something about himself. Listen to what we read in John 3.16. God so loved the world. That's you and me, by the way. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So if you're wondering, does anyone love you? Are you wondering, am I even lovable? Well, let me tell you. Yes, you are. God loves you. And you are precious in his sight. And you may ask, how do I know that? Listen to what Paul wrote. In Romans 5, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to understand something from that. God loved us so much that he died for us. That verse doesn't say he sent someone else. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You see, he didn't send an angel. He didn't send a prophet. He didn't send a good guy to come die for you or for me to suffer in our place. No. It cost him. It was a considerable price for him to pay for our salvation. He suffered in our place. God loves us so much. God loves you so much that he died in your place. I like the way British theologian John Stott put this in his book, The Cross of Christ. He wrote this, In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it, immune to pain? I have entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully before the statue of the Buddha. His legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed, the ghost of a smile playing around his mouth, a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world. But each time, after a while, I had to look away. In an imagination, I have turned instead to the lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nails driven through his hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, his brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty, plunged in God-forsaken darkness. That's the God for me. He laid his laid aside his humanity, excuse me, he laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings become more manageable in the light of his. 
There is still a question mark against human suffering, but over it, boldly stamp another mark, the cross which symbolizes divine suffering. Wow. It is the God who takes our place on the cross that gives us the power to endure and face our own sufferings. And so the Apostle John shows us in this passage of Scripture that Jesus is the Lord of sickness and the Lord of Sabbath. He is the master. He's the ruler. He is sovereign. He is in control. And because of that, only he could take the punishment for our sins so that we might be adopted into the family of God through the grace, through faith in Christ. My question for you this morning, do you know him? Have you fallen at his feet and thanked him for taking the punishment that you deserved so that you might become a child of God. If not, I invite you this morning to take this moment and thank him for loving you so much that he emptied himself of his godness. He stepped out of heaven, became a human being, and died in our place so that we may enjoy him for all of eternity. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are the Lord of sickness and Sabbath. You are the master, the ruler. You are sovereign. You are in control. And therefore, we can trust you, even when we don't understand the circumstances of our life. We can trust that you have a purpose. We can trust that you have a plan. And we can trust that you are right now working on our behalf for those of us who love you. Father, I pray, those listening to my voice, if there is one who has not responded to the love that you've shown us in the cross, I pray that this morning they would come and fall at your feet and that they would say, Father, Lord Jesus, forgive me, for I've done what I've wanted to do. I've lived without regard of you or without regard for what you think want me to do or what you have for my life i've done what i wanted to do i've tried to be lord of my life and as a result my life is a mess so father i pray i pray that you will this morning look down hear my plea forgive my sin wash me clean adopt me as your family as your child make me one of your own Cleanse me. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find no mercy. O oh, sinner, come near Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal So lay down your burdens Lay down your shame All who are broken Lift up your
that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Again, thank you so much for joining us for worship. We pray that the worship service spoke to you in some way, that God's Spirit came around you and comforted you, lifted you up and encouraged you, inspired you. And we pray that this week you will go forth and let God's love shine through you. Now, as in weeks past, let me just remind you that if something we said it, or something we sang or something in our prayer ministered to you, challenged you, touched your heart, and you'd like more information, or if you'd just like to talk more about that with one of us, please contact us. Click down in the comment section and just say, Pastor, that's me, and we'll get back to you. We want to just make sure that we're caring for you. So if, if there's something that you'd like to talk further about, click down below, Pastor, that's me. And we'll know to contact you to follow up. Um, our benediction for this morning comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And this is what it says. And now may the peace of God himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Father, as we go forth this day, let your light shine through us to those around us. Help our lives bring light and joy and hope to those in our community who seem to not have joy or hope. Let our lives bring life that people may be drawn to you and give you the glory. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Thank you so much. We pray you have a great week, and we'll look forward to seeing you right back here next Sunday, 1030, at Church on the Rock Online. God bless.